So I'm Ginger Nickerson, and I work for UVM Extension through the Vermont Urban and Community Forestry Program, and I'm the Forest Pest Education Coordinator. So I provide education on um, invasive forest pests. And so this evening I'm joined by Judy Rosofsky, who works for the Agency of Agriculture, and she's the state entomologist. And Peter Van Loon, Loon, thank you, um, who works is a forester with Vermont Land Trust, and they will introduce themselves a little bit more in their sections. And um, so this evening, because we're a small group, we can be pretty informal um, about this. But the sort of order that we were going to go in is is Judy was going to give an overview of sort of the state of things with Emerald Ash Borer and some background uh, very briefly and how Vermont is responding to it as a state. And um, then Peter and I will talk about management strategies and he's going to talk about it um, in terms of managing forest lands and then I will be talking about things that municipalities need to be thinking about. Um, so that was one of the reasons why we wanted to hear what um, towns folks were from to know how many different municipalities might be in the room. And then as Kevin said, he's going to talk about what's been um, going on in Londonderry. So without further ado, let Judy go. <laughs> Hi, so I'm Judy Rosofsky, as Ginger said, and I'm the state entomologist and the state plant regulatory official. So um, that means I do the enforcement of the EAB laws such as they are, and they are confusing, and we will talk about them. So here we go. So how many of you ever heard of the emerald ash borer before it was found here? Okay, great. So that's because Ginger is doing such a great job, yes. <laughs> All right, so Emerald Ash Moore, depicted here by a costume designed by one of our first detectors, Sue Lover, um, friendly looking bug, kills trees, and the cost of addressing the tree mortality is going to be borne by individual landowners and municipalities. So having a plan on how to deal with that is key to coping with this um, basically disaster. So the Emerald Ash Borer was first discovered in Detroit in 2002, although it's quite clear that it must have been there in the 90s, perhaps even the early 90s. And the states where it was first found did a massive and really expensive effort to um, eradicate it. They, every time one was found, they would cut all the ash trees within a half a mile of that find, which was not very popular. Um, and what they finally discovered is you cannot eradicate it. You can't tell where it is in the trees until they're dying and it's well established. So it's spread now to um, 35 states and five provinces. And I'm just going to point out a little math thing here. It's about, say, 2,000 miles between Detroit and the East Coast. And Emerald Ash Borer's natural spread is about one to two miles in here. But sometimes they go a little further, but not that much. And so it's been here for, say, 18, 20 years. So 2 times 20 is 40, not 2,000. So how is it moving around? Huh. So we have a role to play in addition to planning for the economic burden of this insect and also trying to slow the spread and contain it and keep it where it is and not help distribute it to other places. Not that there's a lot of places left for it to run. Uh, there we go. Um, so this is just showing that wood products are the way this insect moves. It's a wood boring insect. It bores into the wood. You can't see it. When you move wood, you move in. Um, it only feeds on ash, and the three species of ash tree that we find in Vermont in general um, are white, green, and black ash. White and black ash are more susceptible, but the insect will kill at um, whatever their color. It doesn't discriminate. Um, and just to make it sound a little more dire, um, at this point what the Forest Service has been talking to us about is uh, trying to maintain ash on the landscape as a tree. You're not going to see mass immortality for years, um, but it is coming down the pike. And what we're looking to do eventually is try to find a way to 
let ash grow to reproductive age so that they can continue to breed out in nature. Um, okay, so it will kill the trees it infests. It isn't going to happen all at once. You don't usually start to see the signs and symptoms of it until it's been in the tree. Um, mortality can be between one to five years for a tree to die. Um, you don't see the signs and symptoms when you see them. What you'll see is woodpeckers pecking at them, um, or you'll see dieback. You'll see a bunch of dying ash. However, ash are kind of persnickety about their environmental conditions, so there's lots of dying ash, so you can't always tell if you see a bunch of dying ash, is it emerald ash borer, or is it something else? Um, but we'll go through the signs and symptoms, and that will help you figure out uh, what's going on. So in the infestation that we located in Londonderry, it's not very advanced yet. So, um, and it's only in one small area. So it's going to take a while. But this is to show you that it doesn't always uh, kill the trees slowly, sometimes quite rapidly. This is a street with these beautiful ash trees, and three years later, they're dead. We've done a number of things to try to find it in Vermont, because we knew it was coming. And we used, um, how many of you have seen these uh, sticky boxes, right, perfect traps? Um, we use these green funnel traps. We use this cool thing. This is a cerceric wasp. And they um, catch and paralyze insects in the family that includes emerald ash borer and lay their eggs on them. So their eggs feed on the paralyzed bug. It's kind of creepy. But what we would do is go out with nets and catch them and then see whether they had um, caught an emerald ash borer or not. It's a, like a biosurveillance program. Um, and then we have our, our happy outreach staff. Um, trying to talk to people. So one great thing that happened was that as I had to go talk to landowners or whoever needed to talk to landowners, people understood what this was and why um, they might want to let us on their property go to bother them. So before I start talking too much about this map, this is a locations of infestations. Um, remember that it's still confined to a fairly small geographic area in Vermont, so we have some time there's still some things we can do. Um, to, one thing we can do is try to keep it from getting anywhere else. This was the first infestation in central Vermont. Um, I don't know how it got there. The guys who have their camps out there, they don't bring in firewood, but they did bring in building materials. So I have to think um, maybe it came in on something like that. And then this is somewhat natural spread. Then we found the infestation in South Hero that was clearly brought in by firewood. This is up in Alberg. This is basically one continuous infestation. I can't remember if we found Bristol or Derby Line first. I think Derby Line. So Emerald Ash Borers, pardon? I think it was about the same time. Yeah. Um, has been spreading east from north of Detroit over to this side of Canada. So I just always assumed we would find it up here first. So that's not surprising. And the, the infested tree in the US is 20 feet from the Canadian infested tree. Um, <laughs> Then we found it in Bristol. That also seemed like a firewood one. Uh, probably firewood in Londonderry. Maybe. Mm -hmm. I can't say that for sure, but that is what we're guessing. And these were adults that probably flew in from Massachusetts. So definitely trying to be conscious of, I know people in New England are thrifty and like to bring firewood to their camps. But if you could just try to get it near where you're camping, break down and buy it um, instead of moving it because that's how we're spreading the insects around. So let me explain this map before I get too far gone. So these red circles, this we have the technical name of fried egg. This is a fried egg map. <laughs> and um, this, the red circle indicates a five mile radius around where we found the infestation. And then the yellow is uh, 10 miles out. Um, so we consider this to be infested. Okay, so if you're in these areas, in the towns, um, within the yoke, we're asking you to be really, to, to follow the recommendations that we're going to tell you about um, quite closely, if you possibly can, um, to help contain the insect in the areas where it is and not spread it to other areas. Um, and if it's in the, the 10 mile, you're, you're quite likely to be infested, and you should also be trying to follow the recommendations. They're not that onerous. Um, but mainly we're asking you not to move it during the flight season when the insects are active. All right. Um, so is that your, what ha, what's your criteria for the high risk areas? So pretty much um, 
the 10 mile By the time radius. we find it, yeah. Okay. Um, yes. By the time we find it, it's been there for a while, and it's, it's spread. So we're pretty sure that if we, you know, if you're moving stuff in this outer area, it, it's quite likely that it has emerald ash borer in it. So we're just trying to do risk management. Like, what's, you know, what can we do to lower the risk of spreading the insect? Around? All right. Um, this is just showing you a pile of firewood that was. Um, if you if you advance it, you'll see. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, this, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> that was delivered in Massachusetts, and um, did I? Am I still one more? One more. The techno genius who can just help. Right. Um, delivered in Massachusetts, and this is the characteristic serpentine larval galleries that the insects make when you look under the bark. You see that on your firewood, just leave it at home. Um, yeah, so it can show up even when you um, don't really think it would be there unless you were checked. Do you use that firewood, or do you call the state, or what's, what's the deal? What right, you so... Um, if it's stuff you cut on your land, then hey, guess what you have? So yes, if you found it and weren't expecting to, definitely call us. We would like to know. Um, and you can call us just with questions or whatever. But just serpentine? Because you get that pattern with other <coughs> um, or something similar. This is a sort of tightly knit. I, there's not many other insects that make something that looks, this is a pretty classic one. And notice how it starts out little, and then as it chews through the wood, it's getting bigger. Um, but yeah, that's a pretty uh, non-ambiguous emerald ash borer sign. Um, so we developed rules concerning movement of wood, and we were trying to do it, actually, um, Sam Lincoln, I don't know if any of you know him from um, uh, Vermont Department of Forest and Parks, was trying to do a non-regulatory approach. He felt that if we could get buy-in from the industry and major landowners, that that would be a more effective way of getting people to cooperate than just imposing a regulation. So what we decided to do is, um, if states don't impose their own quarantine, then the feds, the USDA, uh, has a quarantine. And so, I'm just going to quickly flip back. So um, we are now part this has another technical name of what we call the great big quarantine. So according to federal law, and state law can be stricter, federal law, you can move any wood anywhere within the federal quarantine. Okay, that's federal. But states can have more restrictive laws, and they often do. So um, to further confuse the issue, um, the Forest and Parks came up with a set of recommendations that we're asking people to use for moving wood, especially if you're in one of the fried eggs. But the Agency of Agriculture has a law that says you can't move wood with pests or diseases in it anywhere. So we made a compromise, which was if you're using those guidelines and recommendations, then we're okay with you doing that. We won't bust you. But if I find somebody moving you know, heavily infested wood in the flight season, then I'm going to be like the wrath of a deity. So, um, so basically, try not to move wood from infested areas to uninfested areas unless you're following the recommendations. You know, don't move it during the flight season. If you're taking it to be processed, tell the mill you're coming with infested wood so they can jump you in the line and <coughs> deal with it. Stuff like that. What is the flight season? So, what a good question. <laughs> How timely. Um, the flight season for the state is June 1st to, uh, I usually say June 1st to October 1st, June 1st to September 30th. The feds, it's still May 1st to October 1st. I won't get you if you're driving around on the 30th. Um, so we're just trying to find the time when Emerald Dashboard is active and not move wood around so that the adults won't emerge or the eggs won't hatch somewhere where they're not supposed to be. Um, but like I said, if they're visibly infested trees, if they have those wood packs, or if I can see those galleries, then I have to obey the law and us people's chops are doing that. So basically, um, 
if you can get your wood locally when you go camping or you're using firewood, if you can not move wood products during the flight season, um, and uh, if you can tell mills that you're coming so that they can get ready for you. If you strip the wood an inch deep off of your wood products and then destroy that outer bark by chipping, grinding, or heating, then you're good. Then you have a perfectly safe log. But uh, ash dries out quickly. So Anyway, so here are the recommendations. I don't know if you can see them that well. But we have two websites where you can find this and all the information you have over there. So it's vtinvasives.org and vtcommunityforestry.org. You go VT. This is my word. I'm sorry. Am I not? No, it's just the uh, motor of the. Oh. Um, and so we had recommendations, um, you know, by, um, by, by material, basically, um, and then a set of things you can do or not do, depending on what it is you're trying to achieve. Um, all right, I didn't pay any attention to when I started yakking, so you should step on here. Yeah. Could, could you talk a little bit about um, kiln drying firewood and sure. how you would know if it's been treated properly to be able to move it? Is right. there certification for um, uh, facilities so, that do it? Or? Yeah, we have compliance agreements with kiln owners, so they should be able to show you or give you a piece of paper with that compliance agreement that said we inspected them and their kiln meets our requirements. Um, till dried wood is great. It's been like baked forever. There's nothing alive in there. Um, so um, most places will stamp it, you know, if you're getting a large lot of wood. So it should, there should be some indication. You can always call me and I can tell you if it's them. And I can send a list of kilns that we have compliance agreements with. Okay, because I know we've got a couple of uh, firewood operators in the area that kiln dry. I just yeah. was wondering if people could ask them if they're... Right. And if they're not and they want to be, they can just call me because I simply come down, look at their records, and give them a piece of paper, and they're all set. Yep. So it's pretty easy to do that. All right. So... Um, this is an adult emerald ash borer. You note the scarlet um, on the abdominal part of the body there. Um, they're not that big. They pretty much um, emerge, you know, it's temperature dependent when they emerge, but it's sometime in June they're going to come out. They'll fly up and feed on the leaves for a while. They'll mate, and then the females will go and lay eggs, and they'll they lay like 40 to 70 eggs total, but they'll lay them in little batches around. So they're sort of active during the summer. Um, and they don't all emerge at the same time. Then those eggs will hatch, the larvae will come out, they're on the outside of the tree, and they'll chew their way into the wood, and then they'll spend a year or two inside the tree making those um, larval galleries. So you know what I need to do? Are is they um, overwintering as adults? Um, they overwinter as larvae or pupae. I think they die after they, I don't think the adults last more than their, once they emerge, they may lay eggs and die and then the eggs keep going. So they overwinter in the tree as... So right now, there, you, there's larvae in the, in the trees. In the trees, yep. So a big healthy tree can, um, defend itself a little bit such that it will slow down the development of the insects. So they don't, they, they don't always finish their life cycle in one year because of the tree response to them. So that you can get all kinds of different life stages within a single tree. It's, it's trying to retard their growth, basically. Um, and so if the tree is weak, then they can, you know, the eggs will hatch, the larvae will tunnel in, they'll molt their skins a couple of times, they'll pupate and um, overwinter and then emerge, so they'll have a one-year life cycle, but sometimes they can't do that, and they'll either overwinter as a larva or pupa and emerge the following year. So they'll keep feeding the next summer. And then, um, I'm not sure I explained that coherently. Yes. Do they mostly eat on the leaves that are high, or can you see them on leaves that are lower? I think when there are a lot of them, they're just bombing all over. The, a friend of mine went to see an infestation in New York and they got out of the bus and the bugs were just hitting them. There were so many milling around. 
the one, yeah. So I was just going to say, it's going to be a long time before we have that quantity of them here. Right. Um, so, um, so that's their life cycle, and it can be, it can vary based on the uh, tree response. So what you're going to see over time, um, this is showing the bark, and so you've got, you have a low density population, you just have a couple of larvae, the tree's fine, um, and then you get, as you get more dense, what you're seeing is those first couple of years, you're not going to see anything, the tree's going to look fine. Um, and then you're going to see its decline and depth over time. And that can take anywhere from one to five years. And you can have a perfectly healthy tree right next to one that's dying. So it's not synchronous. This isn't going to be like a massive wave of ash all dying off. It's going to be, you know, some here, some there. And then it, they'll start increasing in density. And um, so if you're looking at, um, uh, okay, no, Are you looking right. for tree mortality? Yes, I was, and I realized I had to hit the thing. So if you're looking at the emerald ash borer population, right, it's going to peak, and then they'll go away because they've used up all their food resources. Um, but the ash mortality will also peak, but then it will, it will take longer for those trees to die. In the meantime, their little friends will have gone away. So again, the point is that you're not going to see all your ash die all at once. It's a process. It will take time. Um, and it's sort of cumulative, like you'll have more and more dead ash. Um, and I should mention that ash trees are a hazard when they're dead. They're very brittle. They fall over easily. You're much better off cutting them down when they're alive. Um, one thing I do want to mention, though, is that we are trying to find resistant ash trees, ash trees that can resist the emerald ash borer. So some of these are called lingering ash. They're not killed off. They last a little longer than some of the other trees. So we're trying to locate and identify those. So as a landowner, um, you know, economically, you may want to take a lot of your ash out. But there's a lot of ash out there. You're not going to get them all. And if you see some that are lasting or lingering, if you want to tell your foresters about that, um, that would be helpful. Um, or if you choose not to cut down your ash so that you can see if there are any resistant trees, that's um, all sorts of possibilities. Do you know the Whoops. origin of this bug? So it came from Asia, oh, various okay. countries in Asia, and not much was known about it there when we found it here. We went there and said, hey, what is this? What do you know about it? And they're like, it's not a pest. It's not a problem. There's enough natural enemies in its native countries that they keep the population down. And it's over here. It was like, wee! <laughs> no enemies. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, it's a little bit late. There is a green, a native green insect to Vermont. Can right. you show the difference? So they're. Um, they, they look a lot alike, but right. you look them up online. Right. And there's. Um, so I forgot to mention the Latin name of the emerald ash borer is Agrylus planipennis. And there are other agrilis species in Vermont, so they, they look pretty much to the untrained eye exactly alike. In fact, to the trained eye, they look exactly alike. Um, the only difference is emerald ash borer happens to have that nice scarlet lining, which makes it easy even for entomologists like me to be like, oh, that's different. So, um, but there are insects that look almost exactly like the emerald ash borer. So when we look at signs and symptoms, we're going to look at exit holes and uh, <laughs> I'm going to be like, yeah, exit holes, really great, because there are other insects that are about the same size and shape. And you're looking at it like, I don't know. That's not very helpful of me as a ginger, sorry. All right, so things to look for are um, canopy thinning. So you're seeing um, some dying branches. You're seeing it's just not a thick, lush canopy anymore. It's starting to uh, thin out. Um, Epicormic branching or sprouting is when the tree recognizes it's dying and it's desperately trying to send out growth to save itself, to have some remnant of itself left there. That's a good sign, but we don't see it very often. Um, sometimes the trees that are infested with emerald ash borer, the bark will start splitting. And I only just saw that for the first time on uh, Thursday. And if you sneak a look, sometimes you can see the larval galleries in there. That's helpful. If you see, see, see. Peter, that box 
Um, the oh, table yeah. has both um, oh, right. samples of the adult and the larvae and um, bark, if you don't mind passing yeah, it around. Yeah. Right. So this is an adult and a larva. And um, these are samples, I'll just pass this down the middle, of the galleries. And then these are the exit holes. Um, why did you not make that? the red outline? Right, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, could you go back to the previous slide? Sure. Why did you, did you say that that's a good thing, what's happening here? Um, well, it's just the trees, it's like a stress response from the tree, like desperately grow so that something might survive. It won't. Will that survive? No. It's that's the it's it's just, death row. You know, yeah. Really, um, you're saying epicormic branching is an indicator? It can of, be. Because it's also an indicator for animal, for uh, ash yellows. Right. So all it's showing is a tree is stressed. So what we're looking for is combinations of these symptoms, um, signs and symptoms. So, hi, how are you doing, by the way? I haven't sure. seen you in a while. Um, <laughs> But when I see, um, if I'm in an area that I know has emerald ash borer and I see a tree with epicormic sprouting, then I'm going to go look at that tree because I'm like, that's, that could be it. Especially if it's got dieback. But yes, it could be ash yellows. I mean, you know what ash are like. They die all the time. So one of the best signs and symptoms I found that's almost as definitive as the um, larval galleries is um, woodpecks and woodpecker flecking. They fleck the wood off the trees. So they make these holes. And when you're driving around, this can be really visible because of this sort of yellow-orange color. You can see it right away. So when I see that, I stop and look at the tree. And if that, if I see woodpecks and epicormic sprouting, I hardly even need to peel the tree to know what's going on. And if you look at this tree in the background, unfortunately, these also, elms have a nice yellow bark when they're dying, too. So many of the time, I've pulled over and then gone, oh. Um, even though the tree shape is a little different. But when you, this is sometimes called ash blonding when the woodpeckers have flecked off so much bark that the whole tree looks um, like a, it's a different color. And here's my favorite, the D-shaped exit holes. I have looked at so many holes in trees and I'm like, is that a hammer last I can't tell. Uh, because there are other agrilis that are the same shape that make a similar kind of exit hole. But again, it's the combination of stuff. And I've looked at plenty of trees with other foresters standing there being like, I don't know, you think this is a real ash borer? I don't know, what do you think? So Londonderry, for example, there are a bunch of trees. They have fresh woodpecks. Some of them have wounds. So wounded trees can have other kinds of insects that get in there, and the woodpeckers could be going after that. So we did a lot of head scratching. But um, a landowner had found an adult dead, no, live, on his deck. Hmm. Um, and so that was pretty. And there is nothing within 20 miles of that place, which is basically the flight range of Emerald Ash Borer, so they have to be there. Um, so this is more examples of the larval galleries. And so when I see woodpecks and some of the other signs and symptoms, then I'm going to check to see if that's Emerald Ash Borer. And I take a draw knife, kill the tree. And again, these are these sort of tight, very serpentine. Um, they're more. I mean, they go up and down horizontally, but they're tied vertically. Uh, can I do that the wrong way? Yes, they're tied horizontally. Um, it can be confusing. Um, sometimes they look like there are other insects, like serambicids, make somewhat similar larger galleries. You know, we just, um, you just sort of take all the evidence in hand and, um, and go with that. So again, what you can do besides slowing the spread and looking for resistant trees and um, you know, just educating yourself on how you can manage your forest with this insect in it, uh, you can also, if you see suspect trees, take pictures if you're computer savvy and go to vtinvasives.org and then there's a report it function and you can put your photos up or get somebody who's 18 years old to do it for you. And, um, We'll look at those photos. I mean, that's how we found Emerald Ash Borer in this state. It was an alert forester who was updating a management plan. And he said, wow, those signs and symptoms look just what I saw at the forest health meeting last year. I better send this in to report it. And we got it. And Gwen Kozlowski sent around an email that said, uh-oh. Yeah. Uh-oh. We have it now. 
So, um, Ginger and Peter are going to talk about what you can do now that we have it. So, any questions quickly before we jump in? Yeah. I do. Have, uh, has, has this had much of an impact on utility lines in very infested areas? Uh, ash trees can be 100 feet tall, and of course, the cleared area around a utility line isn't that. Yeah, they're having heart palpitations. So they were some of the first groups we reached out to, and um, they are on the listserv, so they get alerted when we find something in a new area. And they're using the fried eggs. Um, that's where they're trying to manage and take down their ash trees, um, particularly because of the hazard those trees represent when they're dead. So they need to know um, where the heaviest infestations are, and what we know about where, the, you know, any. Um, you know, we talk about the infested areas that have are, you know, are infested or likely to be infested. Um, but then we also have an actual ground infestation, like we see a tree with woodpecker holes and we know it's EAB. So we can sort of, we try to use that to track where the insect is moving, basically, and keep those power companies alerted. Yeah, they're, they're well aware of this problem. It's going to be very expensive. Has it been a problem, though, in other states yes. where this yes. first began? Yep. Yes. Oh, yeah. So the utility companies, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about utility companies in my section. Um, but the utility companies in Vermont have been um, consulting with utility companies in other states and talking with the, the public utilities board about. Yeah, we had someone from the National Grid come in and talk about that. And they only use bucket loaders to take dead ash down now. They had um, a death from the hazard trees, so now they use two bucket loaders to remove trees, which adds to the expense but increases the safety. So. Yeah, um, look for your utility bills to go up. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Has there been any temperature <laughs> tolerance or intolerance signs with they're, them, they're or very, uh, longitudinally? Or? They're very cold tolerant. They are. And we're not getting the winters here like we used to, right. because if it's minus 40 for a while, then that will kill them off or increase their mortality. But they like the sunny side of trees, so it seems like they're, you know, situate themselves to maximize the warmth that they can get over the winter. Yeah. Uh, I had read something that maybe white ashes don't have the same mortality rate as green ashes, like maybe only 75% or something. Right. That was a paper that was written, and um, I know one of the authors who said at a meeting that she wished she hadn't written it, but I never found out why. So um, <laughs> it's, it's quite likely that the mortality rate um, for rapidity of death isn't as fast in white ash as it is in green and black ash. Yeah, I don't so. know. Peter, do you have anything else to add about that? Paper? Yeah, I'm, I'll probably talk about it in a little bit in my section. Yeah. I mean, you know, 70% mortality is still pretty bad, so yeah. whatever it is. Um, but it would be good if some were resistant. I would love that. That would be good. All right, I'll turn it over to you guys now. Thank you. I hope I didn't go too far over my... No, that's okay. We'll have time at the end for questions, too. And now the company is shared. <laughs> okay. My name is Peter Van Loan. I'm a forester. I work for the Vermont Land Trust and uh, work with a number of the foresters in this room to help landowners who have conserved land manage their land uh, in the context of our easements. And we've been doing a lot of <coughs> outreach related to Emerald Ash Borer <clears throat> because we've been getting a lot of questions uh, from our landowners and so I'm going to talk a little bit about forest land management but before I get started I'd like to sort of get an idea of what the audience is like so if you have enough forest land so let's say over 27 acres and you're enrolled in current use could you raise your hand so there's a few of those and uh, so the rest of you have 25 acres or less um, anybody with just sort of a house lot and a few trees around it few of those as well okay great um, so this is mostly talking to those folks who have uh, enough land to be in current use but if you don't you know you have a little patch of woods behind your house some of this stuff is going to be applicable to you uh, as well and also um, if you have town forests yes obviously town forests as well yeah thank you Ginger um, so often the first 
question people ask is, all right, Emerald Ash Borer is here. Should I cut all my ash now? And um, the message that we've been getting for the last 18 years when we've been dealing with this thing is Emerald Ash Borer is going to kill all the ash. You better just cut them all now because they're all going to be dead eventually anyway. The markets are going to go to heck, and so just go get them and it'll slow them down. Well, it turns out all of those things are wrong. And so in a way, we've sort of benefited from the fact that a lot of other states and the government have done a lot of research and they've been through this already. So we've learned a little bit. So the answer to the question is not necessarily, that's not a terribly helpful answer, um, but we can ask a few more questions to try to try to figure out what's best to do. So. Do you have ash and where is it? Um, the answer is you probably do have ash. Ash is fairly common. Even if you have a small patch of woods behind your house, you probably have one or two ash trees. Um, and where they are will uh, affect how you, what the decisions you make about them. Um, what will happen to the ash trees when they die? Um, it may be a problem if they're right around your house. If they're out in the woods, it may not be. Again, it depends on how much you have and where they are. And the other question is, is it going to be enough of a problem so you should do something? So to answer the first question of do you have ash, um, where is it? If you have uh, a current use plan, you can just look in that plan and see, all right, I've got a little bit in stand one, nothing in stand two, stand three is pine plantation, no problem there. You can figure out where most of your ash is. You'll get a feeling for how big it is as well. Um, if you don't have that much, I encourage you to go out uh, and just walk around your property and try to locate the, your ash trees. Maybe take a little flagging with you and, and flag them. If you're not familiar with how to identify an ash tree, that uh, vtinvasives.org website has information. There are also lots of books <laughs> there's a handout over there. Um, there's got to be an app for that, right? Um, so have a walk around, see what you find on your property. Um, and it's sort of similar to what you're going to do if you're a municipality and you're looking along your roads or in your town forest. You're going to want to figure out how many you have, where they are, how big they are, because that's going to affect how you uh, move forward. Can you explain that? If you're in the current use program, yeah. they know what, what kind of... Yeah, Forrester has been around your property okay. and they've done an, an assessment of the whole thing. They know basically how much, what, what percentage of your okay. forest is ash and where they are. Okay. Yeah. And a landowner would have that um, information? Yes, they should all have that in their forest okay. management plan. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Okay, so what's going to happen when your ash trees die? Um, like Judy said, it's going to happen fairly quickly. Within three to five years, they're probably going to be dead. Some may live maybe seven or nine years, but generally it's going to move through pretty quickly. Uh, the economic value of the tree is going to drop pretty fast once it's infested, and that's in part due to this. Um, they get really brittle, they start to fall apart. It's also due to the fact that it's really hard to get loggers who know anything about dealing with EAB to go in and cut in a stand that has emerald ash borer because it's so dangerous. If you have a tree that's had EAB in it for three years, say, it's dried out, it's really brittle, it's really dangerous. Like you were, uh, I think it was, you were saying, the utility companies, now they only take them down with two bucket trucks. So going out there with a, with a chainsaw and a skitter in a, in a stand full of EAB infested ash is really dangerous. Uh, so if you want to try to manage your woods and your ash, it's best to do it now before EAB is really here. I mean, it's here, but it's, it's not widespread enough that it's causing problems yet. Um, so when this tree dies, it, like I said, this will all get really brittle and it'll start to fall off and you'll have a dead snag, just this big pole in the middle of the woods. 
And there's actually some value to that, right? There's some good habitat value to that. It's a good place for a hawk, like a sharp shinned hawk that hunts in the woods to perch and do some hunting from there. Or maybe a wood peewee will, will sit on one of these dead branches and feed off some of the emerald ash borers that are flying around. Um, and then when it falls, it's this big log on the ground, what we call coarse woody material on the forestry business. And some people feel like, well, leaving that there, it's a waste. But, well, maybe if we're going to utilize it for something else, it is. But once it's on the ground, it's actually, again, really good habitat. Um, it helps retain some of the moisture in the soil underneath that log. So it creates habitat for insects and salamanders and all sorts of things. And then I'm sure a lot of you have seen uh, old logs in the woods that a bear has torn apart. You know, there's lots of grubs and stuff under there and they're looking for, for that as a food source. So, uh, of course, woody material on the ground is actually a good thing. The space, uh, once this dies off, the other trees around it will grow in. Um, there are some, uh, some issues that we'll talk about on the next slide about what happens when you get extra light on the ground. Um, this 1% this will survive number, we're not really sure if that's right. Um, green ash and black ash, which are not real common around here, I'm not sure if we have any in this neck of the woods. Seen any around Maybe here? Maybe a little black ash. A little black. Um, they do not survive. 100% of those are going to die. White ash, the 1% uh, has been around for a while, but uh, the, the study that Judy was mentioning was done by some folks in southeastern Michigan. They went to 28 different stands. Uh, and these stands were on municipal and state forest land, and they were in the epicenter of the original EAB infestation in Michigan. And they went back and sampled all the ash on those, in those stands and they found that on average, 75% survived. That's probably- I thought 75% mortality, right. so 25. No, it was 75% survived, which was really remarkable. And that may be why she says she wishes she hadn't published that. No, no, I um, thought she felt there was some fly that- um, That was white ash? That was white ash, yes. Was, all yeah, the, all the green ash died. Right. The, but the, the thing is, the mortality, in some of those stands was 100%, nothing survived. In some other stands, 100% of the trees survived. They were still alive. Uh, they weren't terribly thrifty. They were all infested, but they were still alive. Um, so- you say a tree wasn't thrifty, what do you mean? I mean, it's not growing really vigorously. It's infested with EAB. It's got issues. Um, but the thing is, we don't know if that's what's going to happen here, right? Um, people talk about the way it moves through places like Western New York and Ohio, but those places are pretty flat, and Vermont is not. So we're not really sure how the Emerald Ash Borer is going to deal with our topography. Um, so although they had really great, uh, really great, in some places anyway, survivorship, uh, in those stands. We're not really sure what it's going to be in Vermont, but it gives us a little bit of hope that maybe it's higher than 1%. I, I yeah. thought that an earlier slide, um, you mentioned that the green ash was the one that survived. No, no it's, it's, it's a white ash. I know we're throwing colors around right now. <laughs> but green and black ash are definitely susceptible and, and don't survive. Um, white ash seems to have some survivorship. So you will lose some timber value. Um, there will be safety hazards. Again, the amount of hazard depends on where those trees are. If you have a bunch of ash on a, on a trail that you like to walk every day, might be a good idea to take some of those down so that once EAB is here, you can walk along that path and be safe. Um, spread of invasive plants. This is where that extra light that comes into the woods when the ash die come in. So if you have invasive plants already, maybe they're just on the edge of the field 
and they haven't gone into your woods much yet, there's probably a latent seed bank in there anyway. Once those ash start to die back, extra light hits the floor, those seeds germinate, suddenly you have more of an invasives problem. So it's something that you need to keep an eye on. Um, so in this slide, we're gonna talk about options. And I guess I would argue that maybe these first two, monitoring and invasive plant control, aren't necessarily options. They're just something you ought to do. Monitoring, we're talking about just sort of paying attention watching your trees, watching what's happening in the neighborhood, um, paying attention. If you want to be more uh, sort of systematic about monitoring, the Land Trust is working on a, a citizen science project that we're helping landowners become familiar with. Um, it, it, uh, it involves going out and setting up a plot on your property with 40 ash trees in it and watching those trees as the EAB infestation progresses, before, during, and after. If you don't have EAB and you, you put your plot up, that's actually useful information because then we know EAB is not there. Um, and then you, you follow them through the uh, entire infestation. Once they're dead, you wait a couple of years and then you start looking for those lingering ash that Judy was talking about. And if you find some, then we're going to help you try to find somebody, an arborist, who can come take a sample of those and hopefully send it to the uh, U.S. Forest Service lab in Ohio where they're trying to breed a resistant ash tree. So we're going to be doing some trainings on that uh, this summer. There'll be one in Shrewsbury and one in Marlboro, not real close to here, but if you're interested, you can give me a call and we can talk about it. So keep an eye on invasives. If you have invasives in your woods, it's a great idea to treat them before you do any kind of management or before Emerald Ash Borer does the management for you. Because once stuff starts dropping on the ground, it just makes it that much harder to get around in the woods and control the invasives. Um, selective dropping of hazard trees, that's the kind of thing I was talking about before. With If you have a path or that you walk along, or there's something right next to your barn or next to a fence, and you might want to take some of those hazard trees down. Management, we're going to talk about that on the next slide. Um, you can choose to do nothing. Uh, if you decide to do that, um, you can reconsider if necessary, but you're going to need to reconsider fairly soon after you know that emerald ash borer is in your woods because, again, they decline pretty fast. They become dangerous pretty fast. So if you decide to do nothing, just be comfortable with where you're leaving the trees and make sure that you're being safe. Um, so forest management goals. We had two... Uh, we had two workshops for professional foresters this summer that concentrated on maintaining ash as a component of the forest. And um, <clears throat> the emerald ash borer will attack uh, first stressed trees. So if you are going to do a harvest, if you leave the healthiest trees, those are the ones that are going to have a fighting chance. Um, if you've got big, mature ash trees, you might want to think about starting to harvest those. But don't just go out and do a diameter limit harvest and cut all the big ones. You should really should be managing for the ecosystem and the forest, not just for the wood. So if you're, um, if you're going to do a, a timber harvest, try to promote uh, different species. If you can regenerate ash, that would be great. Um, if you can't, there, there are some sites though, like uh, uh, ash really likes a uh, sort of nutrient rich, well drained site. If it's a fairly dry site or it's a really wet site, ash is kind of not gonna do well there anyway. You might wanna just take those out and let something else that's better equipped to grow on that site get going there. Um, slow the spread of EAB. Uh, again, as Judy said, if you're cutting trees and you're moving wood, make sure you're doing it in the non-flight season. Uh, as far as implementation, if you have a current use plan, stick to it, amend it, 
if needed, but amend it again to to uh, amend it to try to maintain that ash in the in the forest. Try to regenerate it. Um, if <coughs> I guess I won't get into the weeds on that. <laughs> um, work with a licensed consulting forester, and, and if you're going to do a timber harvest, or you're going to have do, someone do that, uh, some cutting of trees around your place, um, thinking about timing, if you're trying to regenerate ash, um, do it after a good seed year, which is generally every three year, four years, something like that. We had a great seed year a couple of years ago. It was right after we found the emerald ash borer. We found it in February, and boy, in May, all of the ash in the state were just loaded, and I just couldn't help thinking somebody's, one of those ash trees in Washington County sent out the message, holy smokes, it's here, get going, make ash for seeds. Um, pay attention to soil conditions, that's pretty hard these days. If you can, do it in the winter when it's frozen, if it ever freezes in the winter. Uh, that's a good time to do it, but you then have to consider about logger availability again, uh, control your invasive plants beforehand, and uh, do it before you're heavily infested with EAB. If you find a tree that's got a lot of EAB in it, stay away from it. Kevin. Just a word about markets. I, you know, when we first started thinking about EAB 10 or 15 years ago, my fear was that uh, the markets would get flooded with li ash liquidation and yeah. we wouldn't be able to sell it anymore. Right. Um, so far it's held out pretty well. Uh, yeah. We do feel the pitch here locally. Most of our ash goes to uh, True Temper and Wallingford and they, during the busy times of year when there's a lot of locks coming in, they do fill up. So, um, yeah. you know, we're feeling the pitch a little bit, but so far we we still have a market for it. Pretty much the normal pinch so far. Yeah. And yeah. and the thing is, we've had presentations from folks at from other states, um, and they have said that the market hasn't really crashed. Uh, they have had a lot of ash sent, being sent into mills, but the market, the prices have stayed pretty stable. So that hasn't really been a concern. Yeah. Is there any good scientific data that shows how the where it will spread next? In other words, if you have a tree and the adult emerges with a little D-shaped hole, are they likely to go to the next closest ash tree, or do they skip around? And if they skip around, is there any way of is there any science that indicates the pattern for where they where they will go next? I'm not sure if there is. Judy may know. I think they're keying in to certain. Uh, chemicals that the trees are releasing if they're stressed. I think if there's a stressed tree nearby, they'll go there first, but I mean, that's what we use for the lures, for the purple traps, is a stressed tree pheromone, and we make trap trees. But what I understand from Nate Seeger, who's our U.S. Forest Service expert on emerald ash borer, is that they're somewhat home bodies. They'll stay in that same area as long as there's food, but every now and then, um, one of, like a female will fly 10 to 20 miles away. So you'll have a main infestation, and then you might have these satellite infestations that are smaller, a little further away. Um, so it's, you can't, it's, as far as we know now, you can't predict exactly where it's going to go. And that's why monitoring can be important. You can tell your neighbor, hey, I just saw woodpecks on the trees on my driveway. It looks like it's heading south, so heads up. You know, or you can draw a one to two mile radius around the trees you know that have it and start looking in that area. Right. So if there's an infected tree mm -hmm. and you have other ash near that infected tree, the odds are pretty high that it's going to spread to those, yep. correct? Yes. Yep. So, but yeah. I've seen incredibly high density. I mean, they'll hang out <clears throat> or, or lay eggs on the same tree for quite a while. I mean, there's hardly any space. Those little galleries are all you know, there's hardly any wood left under there. So they don't seem to be in any hurry to go away. Do they need live wood, the cambium layer? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Live wood. 
One of the things um, that people thought early on was if you cut all your ash and you make them fly beyond that couple of miles that they will normally fly, then you'll slow them down. But what actually what, what happens is you've cut all that ash, it just makes them hungry and makes them motivated. And so they go further until they find it. And so it actually ends up spreading faster if you do that than if you leave some behind. Yes, you're up, Ginger. Okay. So, um, again, I'm Ginger Nickerson. I work with UVM Extension with the Urban and Community Forestry Program, which is we share with um, Vermont Forest Parks and Recreation. And I'm going to be talking about uh, issues that municipalities need to be thinking about. So I know we have folks here from a number of different towns. Um, could you raise your hand if you wear some sort of a municipal hat and are trying to think about or advise your community if you're on the select board, conservation commission, tree warden, something like that? Okay, great. So um, you're probably aware then that municipalities are responsible for public safety. So the way that municipalities need to start being concerned about emerald ash borer and how it will be impacting your community is thinking about trees that could potentially become hazard trees and could fall either on um, trees that are on public lands, either on the town forests or town greens or on the public right-of-way, which is probably in communities around here where you're going to have most of your ash trees, whether they could fall on property or on people. So um, that's why municipalities are having to think about how, you know, anticipating this and coming up with management plans. And so there are basically three different management approaches that we've been seeing in, you know, the 34 other states that have uh, been dealing with emerald ash borer before us. One is, as Judy and, and um, Peter have mentioned, the preemptive approach, which is just don't even wait till you know that you have infested trees, just go ahead and take out all of your ash. The, um, the next strategy is what we're calling selective management, which is where you come up with an actual strategy and you say, okay, there, we're going to identify certain trees that we're going to take out sooner and we're going to um, monitor other trees and take them out over time as the infestation progresses in um, a particular geographic area. And then the third approach is uh, really reactive management. It's saying, you know, oh my gosh, we do not have the resources, the budget, or the personnel to deal with this, so we're just going to bury our head in the sand and we're not going to do anything. We're going to wait until the trees start to die. Um, you can tell that I'm a little bit biased about um, the, the reactive approach. So with the preemptive um, management approach, going in, identifying your ash, and just cutting them down before the insect really starts to affect a lot of the trees in the community, the um, benefit of that is you're reducing your risk. So you're taking out all of the trees that could potentially become hazards. So it, there's low worry because you're really kind of taking control of the situation in terms of the public trees that could, could hurt people or property. Um, the disadvantage is that it's a high outlay. It's expensive to, to remove all of those trees at once. Uh, and then also there might be some individual trees that you want to preserve and there are insecticides that will do that and I can talk about that. Um, and then there's also the consideration of, you know, if it's on a town green or something, do you want to replace those trees, which can also be another cost. Um, I'm sorry, Junior. Can we also mention that treatment is an option? Yeah, I just, yeah, that's what I was saying, insecticides, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll be, I have a whole separate slide on that. Um, so the selective management is you identify 
um, you know, particular roads that you're concerned about, or you classify your trees and you say, okay, we're going to take out the, the most stressed trees first because we know that the insect will probably target those first and we're going to leave the healthier trees and we'll take those down later. And, um, and, and coming up with a strategy like that and saying we'll do some now and some now and some, you know, a few years from now, then that allows you to spread your costs out over time. Uh, the, the sort of complicating factor to that is if you choose that approach, it is um, more labor intensive in that there have to be people who are staying on top of the plan and coordinating it and you have to be monitoring the trees on an annual basis to make sure that, um, you know, to look and see how they're being impacted by the, by the insect. Um, and then the, the downside to the reactive stance of just waiting until the trees in your municipality start to die is, as both Judy and, and Peter have mentioned, that once the trees die, they become extremely dangerous. And so um, any arborist or tree removal company is um, going to require a uh, more expensive machinery, so it'll cost a lot more, and heaven forbid, if anybody gets hurt, then there are liability concerns to take into account. So, you know, where your municipality is going to fall in terms of the approaches is really going to vary on a lot of different factors. So people, you know, ask us, well, what is the state recommending? And that's really hard to do because the resources that Londonderry has are going to be really different from the resources in Burlington or in Shelburne or Montpelier. Um, so it's going to depend on, you know, not only the town budget, but also, um, you know, who you have for staff. The volunteer, you know, if you have a, a large body of volunteers who are willing to take on monitoring, um, and the values of the community, what's, what's important. So there's a lot of different things to take into consideration. So I know that Kevin's going to talk about the inventory that London Dairy has done. Are there folks, um, folks from other towns, <laughs> can you tell me if you know whether your community has inventoried your ash on the public right of ways. So, so I know in Wyndham, the Conservation Commission has talked about getting started on it. I don't know that they actually have. Okay. Um, but but they're they're talking about it. Okay. And I saw another hand up. Uh, well, in, in Andover, we've done a sampling. We haven't done. As much as should be done, but at least we started to do something to count the trees along the roadside. Okay. Grafton's uh, talked about it, but has not done the survey. Okay. I went to a meeting where the uh, tree warden for Weathersfield and Ludlow were both talking about that they, I think they had done a sampling as well. But yeah, yeah, Weathersfield actually just sent me some of their numbers. So um, often what, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to advance that. Excuse me, Ginger. What's a sampling? What does that mean? Um, well, it might mean different things to different communities. So I don't know, Jock, do you want to talk about we, uh, I went out and took uh, 1.6 miles of a road in Andover, and I counted all the ash trees in three different size groups. And one was like an inch to six inches, six inches to 12, okay. 12 inches and larger. And then you count the number and how many were in those size groups and you came up with some you can come up with some figures of how many cords or tons or whatever but okay. it's coming up with some idea of how many you're going to have to take down and then get to a point where how are you going to go about doing that did you yes. also like assess the health of the tree yep yep yes. is there a way for us to access resources like that um so we can start our own inventory yeah so that's guidelines. Yep, yep. So that's what I'm going to talk about next. 
Um, so the point to doing an inventory, um, and the difference between an inventory and a sampling is an inventory is you're actually going out and counting the number of ash. But, you know, some towns may say, you know, we have, you know, a tiny town maybe only has a couple hundred miles of roads and it's, or, you know, less, a couple dozen <laughs> miles of roads and, and other towns might have, you know, hundreds of miles of roads. So um, if you're sampling, you're just, you know, kind of getting a, a, a smaller amount, which you can then try to extrapolate from. But um, really, for management, you want to know where the trees are that you need to be uh, keeping an eye on and taking down, because you want to be able to estimate what the costs are going to be for removal and identify which trees you might want to conserve if there are trees that you want to save, and um, also thinking about trees that you might want to replace if they're in an important location. So in answer to your question, um, the Vermont Urban and Community Forestry Program um, does uh, I'll show you a website at the end where you can download uh, different types of tools to help do the inventory. You can do something very simple just with a, um, a paper copy that you can download off of our website and you can go around in your car and one person can drive and two people can be recording the ash that they see out the windshield of the car. Um, you can walk the roads and do it on hard copy paper or we also have an app and I guess Kevin is using his own app. Um, different towns have their own. Montpelier has their own app. But um, I'm a renegade. I don't need <laughs> somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> but we have so the the state um, forest parks and recreation has a, um, an, a an app that you can download to your cell phone. And we also have tablets that we lend out to communities. And Joanne Garten, who is, provides technical assistance to municipalities on forestry issues, can come and do a workshop and train people in your community how to do the inventory, um, whether it's on just a sheet of paper or if you want to get fancy and use the app. So this is what you will, the output that you would get if you use the, the forest parks and rec application software and so it allows you to color code the trees so this community I can't remember um, where this is from uh, the each square represents either a cluster of trees or an individual tree and in this town um, the red indicates trees that they're going to take out and the green ones are ones that they're leaving, at least for now. We also have, there's another color that's, that's a blue, because some towns have decided they're going to inventory their trees first, and then after they know where they all are, then they're going to decide which ones and how many are going to get taken out. So you can put a note in this application about the condition of the tree, whether it's in you know good, fair, or um, poor condition. So there is an insecticide treatment that can be used very effectively to conserve trees. It's expensive, so you wouldn't use it on like a wood lot if you wanted to conserve a, a ton of trees. But um, it is, it's appropriate for a tree that's really important to you, either one that has sentimental value or is beautiful or is on the town green. And, um, and you only want to use it if the tree has not been infested yet. So um, it's appropriate to start thinking about it now. How do you know if it hasn't been infested yet? Uh, usually arborists can help tell. I mean, you don't necessarily know for sure. It's possible that if it's in the really, really early phases, but if, if the tree is at the state where you're starting to see exit holes and signs and symptoms, you do not want to waste your money um, using the insecticide. How expensive is expensive? It, it 
varies. Um, if you have a, if you're an arborist and you have a certified pesticide applicator license, so like the town of Rutland, they have somebody on staff who does that. So the chemical itself, um, do, do you know, Peter, how much? Yeah, and there's two different types. It varies. The emamectin benzoate uh, runs somewhere, or the, yeah. I've heard anywhere the from like eight to seventeen dollars per diameter inch yeah. of tree. An average, a number I've heard quite a bit, is twelve or thirteen. Yeah. But that's just for the chemical. That doesn't include the arborist time to come and uh, actually do the injection treatment. It's twelve dollars right. per diameter inch. Right. Yeah, and it needs to be done um, every two to three years, depending on, you know, as long as, for the life of the tree, as long as you want to preserve the tree, it needs to be done continuously because the insects are going to stay in our environment. Um, once emerald ash borer is here, even after we've lost a lot of the ash in the landscape, the, the, uh, the large adult ash, the insect will will stay in in the environment. So there are two different types of insecticides, and we have a lot of information about them on on the um, VT Invasives website. One of them is organic; it's a byproduct of neem. Um, if you were to Google EAB insecticide or EAB pesticide, you would come up with a lot of things that that. Um, Google or Amazon would say will be effective against emerald ash borer. And as a homeowner, you can apply this yourself. The state of Vermont is not recommending that for a number of different reasons. One, because we don't want you to be wasting your money because you might not do it appropriately. Two, because um, the drenching, we have concerns about it affecting non-target insects or getting into groundwater. Um, these two are both non-neonicotinoids, so they're um, going to be much less likely to hurt pollinators. Um, and uh, so we have a list on the website of uh, certified arborists who uh, are offering this service. You said something before that jumped out at me. You said once the trees are down or gone, EAB will still be with us. Mm -hmm. Won't they be looking for more ash and move out of the area, or they eat other stuff? Or well, so they're not. I don't know if you want to address this, Peter, but they're not going to. Um, nothing's going to happen in a uniform way. It's not like all of our ash are going to die at the same time. Like we still see elm and even chestnut and butternut in the forest, but that once they reach a certain age then the, the diseases will, will attack them. Um, and, you know, when you're talking about a wild environment, nothing's, you know, even. I don't know if there's but a better you know, way to you, say that. You know, <laughs> it's going to be specific, patchy. It's specific to the ash. Yes, it only feeds on ash. Okay. Yeah. And biological controls? Judy can address that. <laughs> You actually have biological controls in the form of woodpeckers. They can kill 80 to 85 percent of the insects in the tree. They just leave the tree looking horrible. And I don't know what the recovery is of woodpeck trees, um, where most of the larvae have been removed by the woodpeckers. They just look so awful. I always assume they're dead, but they might be able to recover. Um, but anyway, the other biocontrol that we, there are a number of tiny stingless wasps that are parasites of the larvae, and then there's an, um, an egg parasite. And so we're planning to release those uh, this spring. We're hoping to anyway. We tried in the fall, but it's complicated. So we were scouting locations to do the releases because there's certain uh, criteria that have to be met before we can get the insects from the USDA. So that's our next step. So the biocontrol agents aren't going to help us now. <laughs> Therefore, what has the cheerful um, description of the aftermath forest. So after the bulk of ash on the landscape are dead, um, and you'll, we hope to be seeing regeneration, smaller ash coming up. And we hope that the biocontrol agents will, um, there'll be enough of them in the population to keep the emerald ash borer population low so some of the ash tree can make it up to reproductive age. 
to. So are these wasps indigenous to our area? No, they're imports. Yeah, and that's always been a problem with other imports that we've brought in. <clears throat> Right. They have to, because of all those mistakes, go through a pretty rigorous process to be allowed in. In addition to which, where we would not be the first state releasing them. They've been releasing them in New Hampshire for at least five years, so whether we approve or not, they're coming our way. What is reproductive age for that trait? Um, I think they, they can technically start producing uh, seed around 20 years, 20 to 30 years, but they're not really producing enough to matter. They really have to be 40 years or up to really start no, producing enough know. seed to right. make uh, it. And 40 years, at, what's the diameter roughly? I know. Depends on the site. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah I know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 40 year old tree could be anywhere from what, seven or eight inches to 14. Okay. Who knows? We'll be on full size. So, oh sorry, can I just add one other thing? So we were talking, listing which trees to choose to treat. So if you have great seed producing ash, you might want to consider saving one of those if you have the resources to do so. Ash seed don't last in the seed bank very long. So you right. just want to keep some of the breeders out there. The trick is that, that ash is dioecious, so-called, which means there are male trees and there are female trees. So if you just treat one, there's no guarantee that you're going to get seeds because you may be treating a male, and that's not going to make seeds. You may be treating a female, and maybe all the males around it are dead, so it's not going to make seeds that way either. They're wind-pollinated. So if you want to try to do that, and some people are trying that, if you want to keep like six to 12 trees, you want to treat them and keep them alive so that they're producing seed, first you have to just figure out which ones are the males and which are the females and save some of each. The ratio is something like six males for every female, mm -hmm. maybe even more, because it is wind pollinated. You gotta have a lot of pollen around to make sure that they get pollinated and mm -hmm. produce seeds. Okay, so um, for folks who work in the woods and take down ash, you may know that when ash die, they are very brittle. And um, when ash are killed by emerald ash borer, they, they become even more brittle and unpredictable in the ways in which the wood falls apart. Um, Davy Tree is a big arborist company, and they say that, that the limbs of ash trees that are killed by emerald ash borer have the integrity of a styrofoam cup. And if there wasn't in water, water in this, I could just <laughs> crush it and illustrate that. So um, arborists are really reluctant to, well, they won't go in, they won't remove trees by climbing them if more than 20% of the canopy is dead. And so if you're talking to an arborist about, about removing a tree, they're gonna want to look at it in the summertime when the leaves are out so that they can assess how many, how much, what percentage of the canopy is dead and what percentage is still alive and healthy and could tolerate somebody climbing. Um, so, the, as I said, the stem fractures are really unpredictable. So what we're going to start seeing once the ash trees are killed by the emerald ash borer is that wind storms and snow loads are going to have a bigger impact than they would on healthy trees. So this is a, an ash that failed in a wind event um, for just 14 months after um, it had been discovered as having emerald ash borer. And funky things happen, like here was a snowstorm, and this tree just, you know, split in half, just like that. And so this is why utility companies and, and um, uh, other folks are really concerned about how these trees are going to be failing. <clears throat> And, and the hazards associated with it. So in terms of working with utility companies, the utility companies, I believe um, 
that Green Mountain Power is the utility company for most of this area. Um, so I don't know what their clearing rotation is around here, but that's something that you might want to be finding out. The um, utility companies are responsible for the, any tree that could fall on their line. So if you're involved in doing a inventory of the trees in your community in the public right of way, you don't have to be responsible for taking down the trees that are um, could fall on the utility line. The utility company is responsible for those. And it's also partially that's because it's really dangerous to work with, with trees around the utility lines. So you can say it's across the street from the utility line. It's, it's not under or around the utility. It's across the street and could reach the if it could that's, fall on the line, the yeah. Okay. So they do with them now, because I saw, I came to a Green Mountain Power presentation uh, six weeks ago here. So they do um, 12 and a half feet on each side of the line. Mm -hmm. but of course, some of these trees are um, taller than that. And Kevin, you were there at that meeting. Wasn't it a seven year rotation that they do? Something like that, but we're going to see a different strategy with PAV being here, and I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, the, th the trouble is we don't know what they're planning this yet. Okay. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that. When I, I can speak a little bit to that also. Oh, okay, great. Um, so I, I work for Wyndham Regional Commission, and yeah, this is Margo Gia. No. <laughs> um, and. So our understanding, and this is my understanding of talking to our emergency management uh, planner who has spoken with Green Mountain Power, so I'm kind of getting it multiple hand, but um, Green Mountain Power is, they have a specialized crew that is working directly on EAB, so it's not taking away from their regular rotations, um, but they have crews that are specifically working on EAB removal. EAB is moving at a faster rate and showing up in more parts of the state faster than their crews can get around. So with the, they started with a strategy where they were going to sort of work in the high risk uh, infected zones and they were going to clear everything from the highest grade you know, transmission lines all the way down to single phase lines. But because the spread of EAB is moving faster and we're getting more infestation zones um, more quickly, they're having to sort of take the highest priority transmission lines, so the high transmission lines and then the three phase power lines. They're gonna be working along those first in as many of those infested areas as they can. And then they will be coming back to communities to work on two-phase and single-phase power lines. So they're trying to keep up. They're trying their best. Uh, they're very aware of the issues. Um, and I believe my understanding is that they're only working on the side where the power line is and not if it's across the road because they have to, um, they have to prioritize somehow. So... That's so, the current understanding that we have. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mary. That's actually new information to me since the last time I went to. The all the utility companies are working together on this. They're collaborating. So just for clarification, uh, utilities are only going to cut within the utility right of way. Is that correct? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's my yeah. understanding. Again, I have not talked directly to the no. power. Um, you know, because that's where it starts to get where, you know, things that are in the municipal, like it's tricky, right? What's the municipal right away? What's the utilities right away? We all have to be working together and um, there's going to be places, um, and I'll maybe just mention it yeah, now, that several of you I know are interested sort of in the safety aspects and the community aspects sort of the, on the municipal level. What can our communities be doing? And there is going to be an EAB-focused workshop coming up at the end of the month on January 29th. It's going to be in Newfane at the Newbrook Fire Station Community Room. 
starts at 4.30, and it's an EAB-focused presentation uh, for municipalities. So what are different management strategies that communities can be taking? As we heard uh, from Ginger that, you know, there's many different ways we can be uh, monitoring our trees, figuring out where our trees are. Uh, well, then what strategy is the community going to decide they want to take on how to address those trees? So we're going to get a deeper look into what are the different options that communities have. And um, you know, the hope is that communities will come and start realizing we all need to work together with our, our, our communities. So the conservation commissions, the tree wardens, the tree committees, the select board members, we all need to be, you know, the town road crews, they're, they're right there in the first mm. front lines of it all. We all need to be working together to figure out what the strategies for our communities will be. So um, if you want to learn more about that workshop or want to register for it, you can find it on the Wyndham Regional website. I believe it's on the home page now, or you can go to the Vermont Invasives website, um, and it's under their calendar. The, the, Vermont, oh, Vermont, Ur Vermont, Urban Vermont Community Forestry yes. on the events page. On the events you page. can register. So. Okay, great. Thank you, Margaret. That was really helpful because some of the utility information was new to me. Is it correct to say that once an infestation starts, there's no way to stop it? I understand you can treat a couple trees chemically, but that's not going to be most of the trees. Once it starts, it sounds to me like it's going to run its course. I understand not all the trees are going to die at once. Some are healthier than others, and maybe there are more woodpeckers in one area and so on. But the es essence of it is once it starts, it's going to run its course. Is that right? If it runs its course, what's the mortality rate of the white ash? How many are likely to be left alive? once the epidemic runs its course and moves on. I, I've heard different numbers. I thought I heard like 75 to 90 percent are going to die, and I thought you said 75 percent are going to survive. I said, yeah. What's, what's the likely, what's, what's left over after it runs its course? And another question that's related is, if most of them are going to die, how do you do a management plan? You can't figure out which trees are going to die first. You have to wait until you see the symptoms that the disease is pretty advanced. I don't see how, how a town makes much of a management plan if you don't know which trees are going to go and when they're going to go, and you're not sure they're sick until they're so sick that now they're really brittle. Well, a lot of ash are going to die from what I've seen from other states. That's um, a lot, but it's talking 70 to 90%. Yeah. In the infested areas that I've seen, yeah, that would be a reasonable estimate. So yeah. most of them are going to go. It's a question of when. It might be years. Right. Or it might be sooner. Right. It's not subtle, though. When you get the infestation in your area and you'll start to see the symptoms gradually increase and then the trees starting to die and, um, you know, it, it will be more clear then. So the part of planning is you can sort of anticipate worst case scenario. What would you do in the worst case? You know, how are you going to... Um, plan so that your town isn't faced with an enormous expense all at once? Like, what things can you do yeah. to prepare yourself for an onslaught of ash mortality? And then if best case scenario happens and we, you know, find some miracle cure or only 25% of the ash die, then you're great. You're mm -hmm. golden. Yeah. And what, what we know, we know from other states um, that have, you, you remember that first map of the US. Yeah. So 34 other states have dealt with that, it previous to us. We don't know because of our topography and because we have a high, you know, more abundance of white ash than they might have had in the Midwest. We don't know like exactly what the percentage is, but I think municipalities should probably, because of the the potential of hazard trees, should plan that you know that the majority of their ash are in danger. Mm -hmm. um, and there was something else I was going to say, and I can't remember. But I think the management plan part of is really like, are you going to take out your trees preemptively? Mm -hmm. Are you are you going to take them out over time and try to spread that out? 
Was there a question? Is there a hierarchy of trees in uh, Vermont? Like we, we've got mostly sugar maple. Then where does ash fall on that? Uh, I'm not sure. Seven, where it seven falls. percent statewide. Yeah, it's five to seven percent on average statewide. Right, but like, but is, is ash. But there are some places, there are some stands where it's almost pure ash, where there's really high nutrient sites and you got a lot of ash. And then you've got places where it's really dry, rocky soil, and you got oak and beach, and there's no ash to be found anywhere. So it's hard to say. It's somewhat mm -hmm. elevational for the record. Yeah. Yeah, and a, and a lot of them. My experience just driving around the state is that uh, often you'll find them on roadsides because it's a nice, open, often, um, you know, more moist environment. So, um, you know, it, it really depends. It can be really patchy. Um, so, you know, Margot just addressed sort of a lot more about the utilities, but, you know, we know that it's going to be affecting the rates for your, your electricity. Um, they're collaborating together, and what they are doing, at least the last that I heard, is that they're chipping the, the tops of the trees and then leaving the logs on site because even if it... Um, it, it's in the utilities right of way, but the tree might be on somebody's private property, so they will leave the, the logs on that private property, and that belongs to the landowner, but sometimes the wood fairies come and remove that wood before the landowner um, removes it. So that's just something to be aware of. So this, we might need to update this slide, but... Um, just that Green Mountain Power, they have received um, permission from the Utilities Commission to add a rate hike. Um, I think it was like $1.2 million, which they're thinking is just going to cover like a couple years of removals. And so probably in another few years down the road, we'll be seeing another another rate hike. And they have um, are starting to work along the high transmission lines. So... Um, there are, when your community is starting to think about how are we going to budget this, the costs are going to vary depending on how many ash you have on your public right of ways, um, whether you're going to choose to you know, grind the stumps, if you're gonna to choose to replace trees, if you're going to be treating any of them with insecticides, and if you're going to be using, um, you know, local staff, or if you're going to be hiring it out. And so one of the things that different communities are doing right now is in, in regions like in Lamoille County and up in the islands, they're working together. So as Margot said, um, thinking about ways that you might be able to partner with neighboring municipalities to see if you might, you know, if you're working with um, an outside contractor to remove the trees, if they'll, or to, to do the insecticide treatment, if they'll give some kind of a, a bulk Free discount. Replacement planting? Replacement planting. So if you're taking out a tree that's on public property, like on a village green, and you don't want there to just be a hole there, and you want to put another another um, tree in its place, that there's a, will be a cost of putting in that other tree. It's it's more of a consideration um, for places that have downtowns with um, trees on, and the strip between the sidewalk and the road. So that's the additional cost in addition to removing the tree that was there. Yeah, putting in another another street tree. Kind of an interesting sideline on that. We're starting to learn um, the city of Burlington, uh, when they had to remove all their elm trees a number of years ago, they replaced them all with green ash. <laughs> so now they're replacing them all again. They're, um, kind of hedging their bets is this is about five different species. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one of our lessons that we're learning is, and that happened nationwide when we lost elms, um, they got replaced with ash. And now we're learning, you know, 
diversify, diversify, diversify. So um, one of the last things that I want to show you, there is this calculator, a cost calculator that Purdue, if you just Google emerald ash borer cost calculator Purdue, um, this will come up, you sign in, you get an account, and then you can play around with different numbers, putting in you know, the number of trees that you want to, that you might be thinking about removing and um, it can help you to, um, you know, plug in different scenarios that you could consider as a select board or, or town manager. Um, so one other thing that communities might need to be thinking about is if you're taking, if you're removing a lot of trees on town property, what's going to happen to that wood? Is it all going to be used by by um, property owners? Is it going to go to um, a, a town a depot or site where people can bring wood that, that is being taken down um, and treated? In Montpelier, they're actually uh, investing in a splitter and they're going to create a community wood bank for lower income families that, so they'll have access to, to firewood. So there's a lot of, I'm sorry? Hardly <laughs> Right, well, <laughs> I'm not sure what it is, but there, yeah. So um, if your community does not have a tree ordinance, then um, you should be thinking about developing one because that will give the tree warden and the town the legal authority to remove trees um, that could become hazardous. And we have on the community forestry website, there are sample ordinances that other um, municipalities have created. And it just, you know, it goes through the process of defining everything and who's responsible for what and what procedures need to be followed in a really clear way because, you know, when you start removing trees, it can bring up a lot of strong feelings for people. So lessons that other communities have learned is, you know, you want to involve the um, select board and the road commissioner in the inventory process and in coming up with whatever the plan is going to be. So it's really important to have the road commissioner involved in that. It's great to have somebody who is wearing the hat of the Emerald Ash Borer Coordinator. Um, regional planning commissions can help. Some of them um, have been helping communities within their regions with mapping efforts and I think that the um, League of Cities and Towns can also help with creating the ordinances if you have legal questions um, and collaborate with adjoining towns. And we have, um, again, on the Vermont Community Forestry website, there are um, lots of resources for municipalities. And you can see the management plans that different municipalities around the state have come up with. And they're not all, you know, big urban, well-resourced areas like Montpelier because about, I don't know, six or seven years ago before we had Emerald Ash Borer, the person in my position worked with a number of small rural communities that didn't have big budgets um, coming up with management plans. And then um, if you see symptoms and are, have trees that you're concerned about, go to BT Invasives, and pretty much all of the materials that are on that table over there, we also have on the, the BT Invasive sites. So I think that's it for my section, and now you're up, Kevin. Okay. Um, I'm not going to take much time because it's uh, getting a little bit late, but um, I want to just talk about what London Dairy has done so far. And um, I've been to the select board a few times over the last two or three years. Um, to talk with the board about what we knew was coming. And uh, being a forester, I've been thinking about it for longer than a lot of people have. Um, so we've discussed it. We do not have a plan, per se, yet. Um, we don't know what our strategy is going to be. Um, we're kind of taking a wait-and-see approach on that, because um, 
We want to see what other towns are doing. We also want to see, um, get a handle on, um, you know, the amount of mortality that we're going to get and so forth. But at the same time, being aware that the longer we wait, the more expensive it's going to be um, once we get into trees actually dying. And also, um, tree companies uh, getting busier and probably charging more money, I would expect, uh, as time goes on. So uh, we're trying to balance those things out. Uh, so I bet I've urged the board to start putting away some money um, uh, in planning for this. And I don't know what we got in this year um, into the budget. What's that? Three grand. 3000 in the budget. Um, that means that's a very small amount compared to what we could be spending uh, at our, a future time, but at least, at least it's a start. And I'm also urging a reserve fund instead of a budget line item because that way we can set aside money. We don't have to use it in the year that we raise it and we can keep building forward that way. So uh, hopefully we'll start doing that as it becomes more clear to us what the costs are going to be and how soon we're going to need it. Uh, in the meantime, I've done kind of a two-tier approach to getting a handle on what we have. And the first thing I did was just drive roads and count ash trees. And I counted everything eight inches and up. And I think I did about 50 or 60 percent of the mileage in town. And I came up with 1,600 ash trees total for the 50 miles of road. Uh, that counted uh, every ash tree, including what's in utility right away. So, um, so then after I did that, then I started the second part of my homegrown project, which is to actually uh, count and map trees that I knew the town was going to have to deal with. So I didn't count anything that, uh, I, that was going to fall onto a utility. So hopefully... Hopefully, the, we aren't going to have to deal with those. But um, at, in any event, we have no capability to do that. We're hiring um, tree companies to do it, and that would that'll get very expensive very quickly. So, uh, my, what I'm mapping and uh, counting now, I, mean, I think I heard a book second. <laughs> um, is uh, I'm prioritizing trees uh, one, two, and three, depending on how hazardous I think they're going to be when they come down and how much they're going to affect the roads and uh, so forth. So, uh, that I don't know if I've done the right thing, and I'll probably find out. Maybe I wish I had done something differently, but. That's what I'm doing so far. Um, as um, I'm the tree warden, but I'm also the EMD, so I'm thinking, um, I, you know, one of our biggest issues around here for widespread problems is power outages. And um, we're, we're already seeing increasing numbers of power outages due to the changes in intensity and frequency of storms. And this is only going to just add tremendously to that. So. Uh, something we're going to have to deal with in the future. In any event, what I did was I just started um, driving the roads, and um, uh, I did a lot of it during deer hunting. But I found it was hard to look for deer in ash trees. <laughs> um, and I've done these roads so far, a total of uh, about 25 miles, um, which is about 50% of the mileage in town. So, you know, I've made pretty good progress. Um, and um, so uh, the, these are actually counts of ash trees and priority one, two, and three. And, um, um, and they're GPSed, and I, I use a, uh, an app called Avenza on my phone to, to oh, yeah, locate them. And um, uh, Jeff Nugent at the uh, Wind Regional Co Commission. Um, geo-referenced our culvert map as a base map. So that's what I'm using. And so it's it's kind of handy because it's, you know, it's got a lot of the information on the roads and the bridges and everything on it as well. Um, so I'm just doing that on my phone and then putting it into a spreadsheet. It's just what you can see from the 
Just in the. Did you go with like 10 feet back? Or no, feet highway back? right away. So, right 20, right so 25 feet each side of okay, center line. Okay. And I did not count. Um, I did not count a lot of trees that are leading away from the road that okay. weren't going to be a danger to anything. So mm -hmm. I'm only counting trees that I think we're going to have to deal with. Okay. Um, and so what I come out with, um, so far I've, I've counted 191 trees, and that works out to just under 400 trees total in the town. That, and it may, it may end up being a little lower than that when I get done, because I've done some of the roads that have more ash trees. Um, and I think overall, the, the 25 miles that I have left may have slightly less. That's where I'm at now. Yeah, that's a great job. I mean, you're further ahead than a lot of communities yeah. with that information. No, this, this really didn't, doesn't take much time. That's what I was going to ask. About yeah. how long did this take? A couple of weeks? Years? Well, it took me Yeah, 16 days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it took me six weeks to get the tag. I probably spent six hours so far doing okay. it. Really, really not much time. Okay. Yeah. Great. Don't get out, don't have to get out of the truck. Okay. <laughs> right. okay. Yeah, okay. Um, so in the presentation we talked, we heard how the towns, the municipalities had a responsibility or liability. What about the adjoining property owners whose trees fall into the right away? Do they have a liability? That's a good question that I don't know the answer to. And we're actually, it just came up last week and we're looking into that. So I can share that information with Margo unless you know the answer. I don't know the answer. Um, what I've heard is... And I don't know if this is correct or not, but that each community has different rulings on that very issue. Oh. And so it might vary community to community. Well, but there's, there's a municipal ruling, but then there's always a court. Right. You know, so, your tree falls on me when I'm driving by. Yeah. My wife takes you to court. You know, where do we go from there? Yeah. Yeah, I, I will try to find an answer to that and get it. Or do, you, do you know how to reach, do you and Kevin know how to reach one another? And, yeah. yeah. I don't know if it would fall under the, the state has that hold harmless. Like you walk through somebody's land and if something happens, it's not really the landowner's fault. Right. I don't know if that would happen with a tree or not. But, I, but I'm on the municipal right away. Mm -hmm. And your tree falls on me. I just know from being on the select board, I just know that people don't want you to cut a tree until the tree is dead. And then you can't get there fast enough. You know, and so it's only fair to say, well, the residents have some responsibility too to maintain and take care of the trees. It's not just the town. That yeah, my, my understanding is that although the tree might be on somebody's private property, if it is within the municipal right-of-way, that it's the town's responsibility for removing the tree. I get that part. Oh, okay. But I'm talking about the tree that's 100 foot tall, and it falls out into oh. the room. That's what I'm asking about. Yeah. Thank you. One thing I would just say is that, you know, uh, Ginger just gave us a lot of information about how to do an assessment of property if you're a, a municipal officer of some sort. But you could take that same information and apply it to your property. So you could go around your property and you could do an ash inventory and you could decide which ones now are a problem and start to deal with them. It doesn't answer your question. Right. I just wanted to make the point that, you know, if you, it's a, it's a, there are, and there are ways to take the information that it's on the Urban and Community Forestry website and apply it 
to your own backyard. It's just a matter of scale, really. But something else a municipality can do is make sure that uh, property owners in their municipality are getting this information and are giving out the resources for people to access. Yeah, and if, if you're a homeowner and you have a yard and you don't have a lot of ash, then you might decide to treat them. Um, some people do. Where in Londonderry has the EAV been found? And are we talking about a lot of trees that are infected and infested at this point, or not very many, or do we not even know? Um, so because this was found on a private landowner's place, uh, state policy is to not reveal that location. Um, but it was in a rural area. And so how many trees um, you have? What were you going to ask? You, can you tell roads? I mean, that's not an exact location. No. <laughs> it is not. And if I, a separation if I told you the road, you're going to be able to go over there and see it. And, and it's like that doesn't maintain the landowner's privacy. So, How about the extent of the inventory? But if you help with the inventory, you might be able to find it on your own. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, somebody was asking about the extent. Yes. No, I was going to talk about the extent. Um, there were probably 12 trees we saw with woodpecks in them. We didn't, we peeled one snag and it did not have emerald ash borer galleries, but I was with two quite excellent foresters and they feel like the signs and symptoms added up to emerald ash borer. Plus, we did find that live adult there. But it's not, um, in terms of the size of the infestation, it's, it's not a large or a heavy one at this point. What about the infestation in Wyndham? Mm -hmm. I, I don't think it's on your map. Yeah, no, that, it's just within the five miles. Right? Yeah. Sure. Sure. Right. So, yeah, so there's that five mile radius. So there, there's the right. tree or the, the confirmed infestation, and then they put a five mile radius around it. So and the then a 10 of the dot mile is radius. Is where the trees are? <laughs> <laughs> the middle of the dot is where the trees are, yes. <laughs> yep, that's where they are. <laughs> so somebody asked about. Um, treating trees and uh, the difficulty of knowing whether you actually have emerald ash borer in the trees or not. And there is a way to know if there's emerald ash borer in your neighborhood at least, and that's by doing a trap tree um, where in essence you girdle it, um, stress it out so it's exuding all these chemicals that are, would attract an EAB if it was in the neighborhood. And then in the fall, you cut it down, you use draw knives to pull, to shave all the bark off of it, and you see if there's any, anything in there. Um, and if you go to the Urban and Community Forestry website, there's in, and I think on uh, BT basis, basis there's information about how to do that. And we'll probably be doing some workshops about that uh, this summer. Do you find you have to use the draw knife a lot? I mean, I, I, I lived in Virginia through a wave of emerald ash borer, and we had to cut hundreds and hundreds of them down. Um, and I found the bark just loosening, just letting itself go when they hit the ground. And, uh, it, but you haven't yeah. found galleries that are quite that Once we, intricate. When, they, when they've been infested for a while, that is definitely the case. But when it, if you do a trap tree and they've only been in there for one season or a season and a half, that bark is still going to be holding pretty hard. Yeah. We also, should we talk about the purple traps? Sure. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> um, so trap trees are great and they're far more sensitive. They'll pick up emerald ash borer much sooner than the purple boxes, but they're a wicked hard thing to do. <laughs> spent peeled enough trees in my life, thank you. Um, so if you are interested, we have a volunteer program for um, training people on hanging and monitoring uh, the purple traps. And we're particularly interested in doing it to delineate infestations within a town. So get in touch with Ginger if you want to. Um, There's a sign-up sheet up there you oh, can sign yeah. up for it. Great. 
Um, and then we found we did that as a trial last year, and it was it was pretty helpful. Um, we actually the Alberg infestation was detected by volunteers up there. That was Bill Barron. Um, so uh, that would be really helpful if y'all are interested in doing that. Um, um, what about like the little seedlings or saplings? Or is that a problem? Also, I mean, you can just see them coming to that, or do they prefer the older trees? I prefer I the older trees. They, but they will get into a one inch diameter. Yeah, down to one inch in diameter, they will infest them. If they're smaller than that, they probably won't mm -hmm. until they grow up. Because, like others have mentioned tonight, EAB is going to be here. It's not going to be wiped out. Um, so. Do you share um, information between um, Massachusetts and New Hampshire's uh, infestations as well? I mean, do, are the radii, as far as Vermont's services are, con are concerned, part added in from bordering areas in New Hampshire and Massachusetts that are dealing with these issues as well, or taken into account? Um, we certainly consider them when we're you know, like that infestation that's um, the adults that we found on purple traps in Bennington County. We think those flew in from Massachusetts. And yeah, we have that information. Yeah. Yeah, this, the the state, our, that's a great point, and I'm really glad you brought it up because um, if you're in a community that's on a border with another state or with Quebec, it's worthwhile to, to look. Um, and see because we're basically surrounded. I mean, New York is mostly red. Um, I don't. I haven't looked at the Massachusetts map lately, but New Hampshire has had it for a long time, and there's a lot of confirmed infestations in southern southern Quebec. Ginger, can you just quickly talk about the grant program and the round that's coming up? Oh, sure. Thank you very much. Um, if you go to Vermont Community Forestry, on that landing page, there are two grants that we have for communities to um, do inventories and, and develop uh, plans and, and get some assistance, financial assistance, for working on these issues. And um, I I apologize, I don't remember what the deadline is, but it's soon. It's something like February, early February. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I looked in the those grants a little bit, and it um, seemed like pretty much, unless you were doing a replanting program, that that's, that's what most of the, uh, somebody that will qualify for one of those grants would, would have a plan to, but more for larger, cities and towns where they're taking down trees and replanting. Yeah, one of one of them it does is looking for replanting, but I, th I thought that there was that the smaller one um, the smaller grants are more is, for education yeah. and assessment. Yep. And so there's two different grant programs. Okay, it's getting late. I think it's a good time to wrap up and I'd like to thank everybody for coming. Um, and I didn't mention before the Conservation Commission here in London here uh, had a part in putting this together and assisting with it. So I just want to recognize. Thank you very much. Thank you.